morning, ladies and gentlemen. It is uh, Thursday. Glad you're here with us as we are ready to take some biblical, theological, and worldview questions. Have a good time with it here uh, today. And because it's Thursday, this is what we've got on the docket for tonight. The epistle of James, rightly divided verse by verse, 7 p.m. Would love to see you for that. We've been, I've, I've really been enjoying uh, going through the book of James and uh, taking that, having a good time with it. Uh, and uh, so hope you'll join us. 7 p.m. tonight. Uh, little programming note. Several programming notes. Sunday. Let's start with Sunday. Sunday, we've got um, uh, idol worship, idolatry. What is it? And do we do it? We're accused of uh, being idol worshipers when we get our priorities wrong. Let's talk about that a little bit. Let's look into the scripture and see what idolatry is in the scripture and whether or not we do it. That'll be, ooh, I've got a sneeze coming here. There we go. <laughs> yeah, should have at least turn the mic off, but at least didn't have to look at it, right? <laughs> there we go. Uh, and... Um, uh, idol worship, uh, what is it? Do we do it? Uh, we'll, we'll take a look at that biblically and uh, put uh, all that together. And if you join us for the music time at about 1045, we'll do a little um, celebration of the birthday of the United States of America as well, which means on Monday we will not be broadcasting because Monday is Independence Day here in the United States. And so uh, uh, we will uh, be taking the day off, going to a parade I am with the family in Red River, New Mexico. And uh, it's a wonderful little parade. You should come sometime. And uh, I got uh, some family coming in from out of town and all that. And... Tomorrow, I will not be broadcasting. Tomorrow, uh, I am going to take the day to study the book of Romans because really looking forward to doing Romans graphically presented in September. But uh, hey, putting together a whole book of Romans uh, for the three days, uh, September 3rd, 4th, 5th, I believe it is, uh, getting all that. Takes a little study in advance, and so I'm trying to take some of these Fridays to do that. So, uh, you know, I'm, I'm sorry uh, for those of you who are... Uh, uh, addicted to Ask the Theologian. No, I'm not sorry. I'm glad you're addicted, but I am sorry I'll be gone. That tomorrow and Monday, staying right here in town, doing study on Friday, doing, uh, doing a little parade, and I don't know, probably cook a hamburger or something on, uh, on Monday. Uh, we'll see. What are you all doing for 4th of July, those of you who are uh, in the United States anyway? Uh, yeah, just just tell me what you're doing. Um, Nancy, you should come on down to Red River. Fun times in Red River. Yeah, just come on down. It's not too far from Pueblo. Uh, but the parade is in the morning, like early. I don't know, 9 o'clock or 10 o'clock or something like that. So... You know, you gotta you gotta get up and get at it. Uh, even even from our house, about a thirty minute drive. So, okay, Miguel, our friend Miguel is here with us today. What do you all do on Independence Day? <laughs> Celebrate the fact that the United States is no longer um, uh, what 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 do you call it when the United States had control over the Dominican Republic a while and you celebrate your independence from the U.S.? Is that what you do in the Dominican Republic? I'm not sure. Good to see. By the way, Miguel, Jose Miguel, he is our missionary of the month for the month of July at Taos First Baptist. Those of you who watch our full broadcast, uh, you see uh, our uh, missionary of the month. Uh, this month, we've got Mark and his family in Asia, but uh, this month ends today. So starting tomorrow, uh, we'll have uh, Miguel and Naomi uh, or is it Noemi? Hmm. Help me with that, Miguel, on, on pronouncing your wife's name. I should get that right before Sunday. Uh, and uh, check that out. Oh, Deb is okay with me being off tomorrow because it's Farmer's Market. Farmer's Market on Friday. She goes to the Farmer's Market instead of listening to Ask the Theologian. Um, farmer's Markets can be fun. Um, I enjoy that. For Deb in uh, Crystal Springs. No, this is, excuse me, Deb in, uh, in uh, the Ozarks. Nothing special on the 4th, just another day. Another day is good. Another day is good. And, you know, I like... Uh, this, one, this one isn't necessarily this way for us this year because we've got family in. 
Uh, I like those holidays in which you don't do anything. Like, um, like Memorial Day. What a wonderful holiday. You just sit on your patio. That is my idea of a good holiday. Um, so, oh. Never mind, I was reading reading that wrong. <laughs> uh, I have to, we'll get into the actual program here in a moment. For those of you who are new with us, we don't always just chat like this, but sometimes. Um, and, uh, oh, Nancy uh, got, got a grandson coming to work on Ed's 1971 Kawasaki motorcycle that he's hoping to inherit. Well, nice. I'm glad he's at least going to, you know, work up uh, with Grandpa a little bit, try to get that going. That'll be fun. Um, uh, let's see. Um, uh, oh, uh, our, our friend uh, Jennifer and Yakult going to... Whitefish, Montana and Glacier National Park. That will be fun. I, I would say I would do that. Uh, over Red River, New Mexico, I would go to Whitefish, Montana, Glacier National Park. I've not been there. Um, one of these days, I would like to go to Glacier National Park. I love that area of the country up there. Um, so, yeah, uh, if you didn't invited me, I probably would have gone. Well, probably not. Now, Debbie and Crystal Springs... Another day in the garden picking tomatoes and beans. How about, Debbie, do you do fried green tomatoes? Uh, it seems like a Mississippi thing. Honestly, I've never had fried green tomatoes. Um, but, or is that something that's only in the fall? I, I'm not sure. Is that something you do like when winter is about to come and you've got the, the green tomatoes and you need to use them up? I'm not, I'm not exactly sure. Um, but, uh, yeah, um, Good for that. Uh, the fourth is more like a day of mourning. There is some of that, uh, Scott uh, points out, that, wow, what we're supposed to be and what we are, mm, it, it, it does remind you of that, unfortunately. Our friend Lenny in London, what do our British friends do while we are celebrating freedom from the Brits? <laughs> there's, there's the million dollar question. Uh, <laughs> Thanks, uh, Lenny. Good to see you in here today. Uh, okay, I should get to I should get to questions, shouldn't I? Here for biblical, theological, and worldview questions. That's what we do. We're going to do a, a television program here in just a moment. But I want to I want to jump right into a question even before we get into that. And uh, this question comes from our friend Dr. Tom, who is in Cambodia, missionary doctor, missionary pastor there, and he's got a question going to be uh, preaching from 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 26 through uh, 34, and uh, has a little question about, let me get my screen already there, uh, all, already for this morning, there we go, uh, has a little question about the, the meaning. Could you help me rightly divide 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verses uh, 26 through 34? This is the passage of uh, the Lord's table, coming to the Lord's table. And let's just, let's just look at it here for uh, just a moment. And by the way, I do have, for those of you who'd like something a little deeper, I do have a series on 1 Corinthians, and you could find the section on 1 Corinthians chapter 11 at randywhiteministries.org. But let's take a look because there's some interesting stuff here. Here at the beginning, as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you do show the Lord's death till he come. Well, Dr. Tom has a question that's showing what does that mean? What does showing the Lord's death until he comes? By the way, it is my belief that the spelling here, shoe, shoe is just a different way of spelling show. It means the same thing, to display or to manifest. Uh, the word here is actually cat angelo, cat angelo. Remember, angelo or angelo is where we get the word angel from, and it is the word that means message. So, so this angelo has the idea of a messenger. When you put cat or cata in front of a word, it intensifies it. Basically, it says that, and this is very interesting, it says uh, that the greatest way of showing the Lord's death, not only giving the message, not only angelo, but cat angelo, the intensified form of showing the Lord's death, 
is to eat this bread and drink this cup. Well, that's kind of interesting. You know, I would think it would be to uh, uh, to make it into a movie, right? Or I would think it would be to uh, tell the story, to uh, read read out of the scriptures the story uh, of the uh, Lord's death, to uh, to uh, uh, proclaim a sermon that was on the Lord's death. And yet, the Bible tells us the the intensified way, not necessarily the greatest, but Cat Angelo has taken as far as you can go, so it wouldn't be a, a stretch to make that argument the greatest. Uh, the Cat Angelo way, we'll put it that way, we'll just go Greek. The Cat Angelo way of showing the Lord's death is to eat this bread and drink this cup and do it till he come. There's probably in that the consistency of eat the bread, drink the cup, eat the bread, drink the cup, eat the bread, drink the cup, so that it becomes a, I'll use a dirty word for evangelicals, it becomes a ritual so that you're known by it. And indeed, I would say one of the things that the Christian world is known for is eat this bread and drink this cup. As a matter of fact, almost exclusively across Christianity, one of the things we do and we always have done and I suppose always will do is eat this bread and drink this cup. So there's a little bit about that, and, and, and probably this is not the major thing, but there's a little bit about eating this bread and drinking this cup, which says, hey, this is... Uh, this is a display of the people who believe in the death, burial, and resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. This is the thing they do. You could look at others. You know, what is the thing that Christians do? Do they do the mark of the cross? No, only some people do that. Do they bow down uh, uh, before an altar? No, only some people do that. Do they stand and raise their hands? No, only some people do that. Uh, do they uh, sing praise songs? No, only some people do that. Do they sing chants? No, only some people do that. Do they have a sermon? No, only some people do that. Everything else in the Christian life, we would say, no, only some people do that. But this is the thing that Christians, whether it was meant this way or not, that Christians have joined together, and yeah, there's some different meaning behind it, but eating the bread and drinking the cup is associated, I would say, worldwide with those who proclaim his death. And therefore, there is an announcement, if you will, given that the Lord became flesh on our behalf and his blood was shed on our behalf. You can't eat the bread and drink the cup really without thinking of the incarnation and the, uh, the, the sacrifice on the cross. Those two things are so embedded within that that perhaps there is no better way to proclaim the Lord's death, cat angelo, than to eat this bread and drink this cup. And so then it goes on with some uh, interesting kind of stuff as it says, uh, whoever, uh, wherefore, whosoever shall eat this bread and drink this cup unworthily shall be guilty of the body and blood of our Lord. Well, that one uh, begins to get, uh, I don't know, a little bit uh, uh, frightening. If I do it unworthily, I am guilty of the body and blood. In fact, if we were to jump down uh, to verse 29, he that eateth and drinketh unworthily eateth and drinketh damnation to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. Whoa. You know, if, if you look at this, we would say, Wait, I don't, as a right dividing preacher, I don't know that I could really stand before my congregation and say, now we're here to proclaim the Lord's death. If you do this in an unworthy manner, you are going to be guilty of the body and blood of Jesus Christ. As a matter of fact, he that eateth and drinketh unworthily eateth and drinketh damnation to himself. This doesn't sound like grace, does it? It doesn't sound like uh, anything that would even fit in the body of Christ, does it? I mean, these are very, very strong words. Now, in the middle of 27 and 29, of course, is 28, let a man examine himself, and so let him eat bread and, and, uh, and drink of the cup. Let him examine himself. So the, the solution, if you will, becomes examination. It's the remedy for the problem that is expressed in verses uh, uh, 27 and uh, 29. The remedy is to examine yourself. Now, 
The problem is you and I are not saved by self-examination. That would be works. Uh, And then the problem is this word damnation right here. If you and I are saved, then, you know, can we be damned? Is he talking to saved people? I would say that the word uh, damnation as it's given right here. Uh, In fact, if we were to hover over it, uh, uh, eventually, there we go. Let me go down just a little bit. Uh, if we're hovering over it, notice all those others that light that light up in blue. That's because they're the same root word. So you've got damnation, discernment, judge, condemned, condemnation, all the same root word, all used right there. It is a a word here that uh, is uh, to to bring about. Uh, that there has been a a judicial decree made against you. Damnation. Doesn't necessarily mean hell, just that there's this judicial decree against you. Now, he is damned or has the judicial decree. Why? Because he is not discerning the Lord's body. Now, I think in here, what he's talking about is something that the Corinthians were doing. And that is the Corinthians were having the agape feast. And in their agape feast, they were taking the, the, the bread and the wine of the Lord's table, just like, you know, I'll speak in, uh, I'll I'll speak Southern here for a moment. They were taking it just like the roast beef and the iced tea that they were having at the potluck and not discerning the Lord's body in the display of what they're doing. You you really, I think that uh, a congregation today even would want to know, hey, th- th- you know, afterwards we're going to have roast beef and, and, and sweet tea, but this is a proclamation. That is a meal. This is a proclamation. We want to separate these things, and we want these things to be uh, holy and valuable uh, to us. And in, in this way, we want to discern the Lord's body. Now then, he goes on to say, for this cause, many are weak and sickly among you, and many sleep. We would judge ourselves, we would not be judged. It goes back down to that uh, discernment or, excuse me, evaluation kind of thing. But this verse right here many are weak and sickly, uh, uh, many are weak and sickly, and, and uh, many even sleep. You know, you, you take that, and uh, is there anyone who would, in today's world, in their church, teach? Hey, you're, you are going to die if you don't do this right. Now, with all of that, we've got a couple of choices. One is we can take this passage and say, hey, this is something for us, and we have to apply it to us, and we better warn people. If you do this unworthily, you do not discern the body and blood of Jesus Christ, then you'll bring damnation upon yourself, you'll lose your salvation, or you will, you will certainly have a condemnation that comes upon you, and you will die. I don't really know anybody who does that. There's probably some out there, but I don't know them. That's one option. Another option is we can say, this is not for us at all. This is, uh, this is completely something that was for the Jews, and the Corinthian church was uh, Jewish, and uh, of course they were doing this, and uh, it's not for us. So surely there's something somewhere in the middle. That is to say, absolutely everything, take it literally and take it to us, and that is you better examine yourself or you're guilty of the body and the blood of Jesus Christ. You're taking damnation upon yourself for not discerning the body and the blood of our Lord, and uh, many are sick, and uh, many are weak, and some are dead. And that's taking it all 100% literally to ourselves. The other is take zero 100% for ourselves. It's all for the Jews. Now, I think most of us, even most of us right dividers say, wait a minute, this, this, the, 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 the Last Supper, if I'm right that the Last Supper is not the Passover Supper, I think there's no way it can be, 
But if, if uh, it's not the Passover supper, then this is not something that Jesus was instituting for the Jewish nation. He was certainly instituting it for his followers. All of his followers right then happened to be Jews and the mystery wasn't given yet. But it seems like the Lord's table is something that those of us in the faith here and now, we could take for ourselves. I think in the end, you have to take uh, this uh, particular passage and you begin to look at it and you say, you know, uh, like verse 33, wherefore my brethren, when you come together to eat, tarry for one another, if a man hunger, let him eat at home. You have to take some of these things and say, there were some circumstantial things that were taking place uh, that are not necessarily the same circumstances that we have. And, uh, and these were not just because they were Jewish, but it's because they were living in the period of the overlap. In this period of the overlap, I think there were many instances, more than we know about, that are given like Ananias and Sapphira who died. Here, many are sick and weak and, uh, and uh, others, others are, are asleep. Many are asleep. Uh, there were people who were dying from that. But now we're in an age of silence. Now the kingdom is not being offered. Now as we take the Lord's, uh, the, the Lord's table, the bread and the wine, we come together and I think indeed we would say, uh, yeah, this is, uh, this is a matter of tremendous importance because it is a matter of proclaiming the Lord's death and we want to do it in a manner worthy. He doesn't even tell us what the, what the manner worthy is and... So in, in the end, the manner worthy has to be, how can I most worthily proclaim the Lord's death? I ought to do that with some introspection, I think. I ought to do that with some uh, degree of seriousness. I ought to do that with, uh, uh, with some uh, degree of uh, understanding the Lord's death and what it means and how it relates dispensationally. Taking all those together and praising God that this is not a period of the kingdom offer, a period of... Uh, of uh, tremendous silence. So thanks for that question on exegeting uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 11 verses, uh, what did we start with? Uh, verse uh, uh, 20, 26 down to 31. I appreciate that. Okay, let's move on to our next question. We'll get a television timer started, by the way. Rightly divided commentary. Titus and Philemon is uh, available for order now at dispensationalpublishing.com. And uh, here's, here's, here's the first copy, not bound, not covered, all that kind of stuff. Uh, but uh, those will be ready to go out next week. And I uh, hope you'll, uh, you'll, you'll take advantage of that. I appreciate it. Okay, let's, I don't usually wait on this long on the television program, but it is time to start the TV program. Let's give it about 15 seconds and uh, we'll get right into it. And let's start with a question from Rudy in Belgium uh, uh, today and um, be uh, ready to go here in just a moment. And happy anniversary, Aunt Nancy and Ed just celebrated 52 years of marriage. I just happened to glance down at that. And uh, Debbie's got green beans, okra, bell peppers, tomatoes, sweet potatoes, yellow squash, spaghetti squash, and cantaloupe. Debbie and Daryl are busy in Crystal Springs, Mississippi. And if you drive by, vegetables just appear in your car right? Because this is the time of year in Crystal Springs, Mississippi. Don't leave your car unlocked. It will be filled up with maters and bell peppers. <laughs> it's a good life. I'll be right back in about 15 seconds. I wasn't supposed to be there. <laughs> so here we're going to go and we're going to redo this uh, now.
Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to Ask the Theologian. I'm Randy White, and we take biblical, theological, and worldview questions 24 hours a day, seven days a week at askthetheologian.com. We begin today with a question from Rudy in Belgium, who uh, speaks about the resurrected body of Jesus passing through walls. You know, we had a question the other day that had to do with the rapture, and at the rapture, whether or not the graves have kind of an explosion for the body to come out. We were debating a little bit on whether or not the uh, body uh, just uh, 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 translates itself through the six feet of dirt or whatever it may be. Uh, onto the ground, or if the grave uh, is is actually uh, uh, torn open. We looked at the passage of Scripture in the Gospel of John where it talked about the graves being opened, and many of the saints uh, uh, rose from the dead and uh, walked about into the city of Jerusalem on that day of Jesus' death. And, and, and in that discussion, Charles brings up the body, uh, excuse me, the question of John chapter 20, verse 19, concerning the body of the resurrected Lord and uh, asks the question about whether or not uh, the, the resurrected body of Jesus could pass through walls and if the resurrected body of Jesus could pass through walls, then uh, it would, uh, uh, you could at least presume that there would be no need for an explosion of the grave when the dead in Christ are raised. Okay, let's check at that and look, look to specifically the resurrected body of Jesus. Could it uh, come and go regardless of the walls? Now, John chapter 20, verse 19 says, upper right-hand corner of your screen says, uh, then the same day at even, e- evening, this was the uh, day of the resurrection, being the first day of the week when the, disi- when the doors were shut, where the disciples were assembled for fear of the Jews, came Jesus and stood in the midst and saith unto them, peace be unto you. Now, let me say that it, it is one of my uh, principles of biblical interpretation to try to be careful to make sure that the that we don't make the scripture say something that it doesn't say. Just let the scripture say exactly what it says. Now, if we take that principle there and we come into, again, John chapter 20, verse 19, it says, okay, they were there. The doors were shut where they were assembled, came Jesus and stood in the midst. Now, you could assume that Jesus came into the midst of them without uh, without, uh, going through the door. You could assume that. You could also assume, if you wanted to, and it might not be the most natural assumption, but you could also assume, hey, the doors were shut for the fear of the Jews, but Jesus wasn't afraid of the Jews. He came. He knocked on the door. They opened up the door and uh, he came in and stood in their midst and said, peace be unto you, as he sort of gave a greeting. Now, the, the truth is that text doesn't completely tell us. Now, remember that I like to convince the ladies and gentlemen of the jury. I think it is an easy conjecture to say he passed through walls. And that might be the most natural thing. I don't know if we were to take a hundred people off the street and give them John chapter 20, verse 19, and say, how did Jesus get in there? It'd be an interesting just to go down to the mall and, uh, you know, know, read this verse and tell me how Jesus got in the room. And just to see what their responses were. My guess is that the majority of them would say, oh, he just uh, uh, appeared translated through the walls and appeared right there in their midst, the door remained shut. But there may be a few skeptics, and I appreciate skeptics, there may be a few skeptics that said, well, the doors were shut, and so obviously he knocked on the door and they opened the door, and he came in and stood in their midst and said, peace be with you. Now, if we're just, you know, sitting around in Sunday school trying to figure this out, then we can leave it at conjecture. If we're trying to convince the ladies and gentlemen of the jury, why, ladies and gentlemen, he just appeared right there. I think the jury would come at it much more skeptically. I think they would say, ha, 
What it says is the doors were shut, came Jesus, stood in their midst. That's all we know. We don't know if he went through a window. We don't know if he uh, walked through the wall. We don't I know if he opened. Now, I know this is getting, uh, uh, shall we say, persnickety. Uh, because so many of us do say, no, he, he obviously came through the, through, but, but what I want to say is, you know, it may be so obvious to us, but it doesn't actually say so. Now, could he have? Yes, absolutely. Is that the most reasonable conclusion? Probably so, I would, I would say. But beyond the shadow of a doubt, did he? No. And when I build theology, I want to build it beyond the shadow of a doubt. I want to know that I know that that's what it says. Chapter and verse, I can go right here and there it is. There it says it. That's ideally, that's what I want. Some theologies, by the way, you have to build without that. And those are typically theologies that become contested. And uh, this is why there are uh, so many uh, denominations because they uh, look at these various things and have to uh, say, okay, well, I see this a little differently and that a little differently and carry that through. Now, Rudy also brings up Matthew chapter 28, uh, verse 2, which is also about the resurrection. And uh, it says, let's start here in verse uh, verse 28, verse 1, in the end of the Sabbath, as it began to dawn toward the first day of the week, came Mary Magdalene and the other Mary to see the sepulcher. And behold, there was a great earthquake, for an angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the door and sat upon it. His countenance was like lightning. Now, this is speaking of the countenance of this this uh, angel, his countenance was like lightning, his raiment white as snow, and for fear of him the keepers did shake and become as dead men. And the angel answered and said unto the women, Fear not ye, for I know that ye seek Jesus which was crucified. He is not here, for he is risen. Now, this does appear to say that as it began to dawn, there was a great earthquake. And this is when the angel of the Lord came and rolled back the stone from the door and sat upon it. You know, it's interesting. In John, we always picture it as he appeared in their midst. But for the resurrection, I would say we always picture it as the stone was rolled away and he came out. Haven't you been to the uh, church play, the musical, uh, the uh, uh, saw it on the movie or on the television show of the life of Jesus? It was always the stone rolled away, the light within, and boom, here comes Jesus standing out, walking out of there. So why does our mind always read one as walking through walls? The other always puts this in, a, in, in the order that the stone was rolled away first and, he, and, and then he comes out. Now, I would say at first reading Matthew chapter 28 verses uh, one and two and going down uh, to, to five anyway, looks more like he was raised before the stone was rolled away. He was gone before the stone rolled away. That would look like the first reading. Let's go back into that and be just as persnickety and see what Matthew chapter 28 actually has to say. So, uh, behold, there was a great earthquake. We've got a little marginal note right here. And uh, it says, had been. Let's look at this in the uh, Greek, uh, uh, chapter uh, 28, verse 2. Uh, So an earthquake, in the interlinear, it says, an earthquake there was. Now, let's look at um, at the the, the verb tense here. It's a verb, uh, aorist, middle indicative, third third person. Aorist is what we want to uh, know. Aorist is a tense that we don't really have in English. So it's always a challenge to get... a a, a tense from another language into our language. You simply don't have the tools really to do it. Aorist is often, most often, translated in the past tense. But aorist isn't really the past tense. You can use aorist in the future, or you can use aorist in the present. The aorist tense is 
it took place in a moment in time. Boom. It's a, it's a dot. It is done. It's not an ongoing kind of thing. You would use a different tense for that which is ongoing. So, uh, you know, if it was saying, uh, as they came, an earthquake was taking place, well, then they would not use the aorist tense. So aorist tense, there, there was an earthquake, there is an earthquake, there will be an earthquake. Ah, what, what do you do with this? You have to go by the context to bring this into the English language, and as a matter of fact, in the Greek. So here the, uh, the, the, the issue is this, there was at a point in time a great earthquake. Did it take place as it began to dawn? Or did it take place earlier that the angel of the Lord descended from heaven and came and rolled back the stone? And then later, the, you know, the keepers didn't find him and the, and the uh, women came up. Our problem is, ladies and gentlemen of the jury, that I don't think we can convict either passage of actually saying Jesus had the ability to walk through walls. Now we're not really in a court of law, are we? And here we're in the case where there's not ladies and gentlemen of the jury, there's me and there's you. And we're reading the Bible and we're trying to come up with, uh, uh, with this uh, knowledge. I don't know that we build a doctrine out of it, but this knowledge of whether or not the resurrected body can pass through uh, the, the physical world and have no problems. You know, I suspect that if we, uh, if we knew how to do it, I suspect that physically it's possible now. Physically, and by that I mean in the world of physics, you know, we're a bunch of molecules and this question, the assumption mug is a bunch of molecules and can't pass through it now. But the truth is there's space between these molecules and there's space between these molecules. And, and if we knew how to do it, we could uh, maneuver those where they could pass right by each other and the whole remain intact. I don't know how to do that. I don't think at Los Alamos Laboratories they know how to do that. Uh, but I suspect physically they would agree it is possible. If we could just figure out how to do it, it is possible to let those molecules stay intact and yet also pass through one another. If, if we know that it can happen physically, then surely when the one who is the creator and sustainer of heaven and earth, Jesus Christ, when he wants to pass through something and remain intact, surely there's a, there's a way to do that and an ability to do that and the control to do that. So I think we, we, we come up with how did Jesus get out of the tomb? Was it the stone rolled away and he walked out through the open entrance or did he go through? How did Jesus get into the room that night? Did he uh, enter in uh, through, uh, through, through a closed room that remained closed or did they open the door for him? I don't think we can answer that. I think we could say surely, however, the resurrected body would have this, uh, this capability of uh, pulling through. Very interesting uh, topic that uh, gets into all sorts of, uh, I'll say, uh, physics and metaphysics in this and what kind of uh, metaphysics are prepared for the future in our resurrected body. I, again, I suspect that uh, we know so little about the world around us. You know, I have begun to believe that, uh, a friend put it this way, he said, uh, uh, he said, I think everything we've been taught over the last hundred years has been wrong. <laughs> it might be a slight exaggeration, but not much. I think if you take uh, the medical world, for example, health and science, uh, I think you could find, here's all the standard teachings of health, you could find over here a set of doctors who say every bit of that is built upon the wrong assumption. 
turn it upon its head. It's all completely wrong. We've been doing the wrong thing for a hundred years. I think in physics, the world of physics, mentioned Los Alamos Labs in New Mexico a moment ago, and you could go to, uh, 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 you know, Livermore or, or uh, uh, Tennessee or uh, uh, Albuquerque, Sandia Labs, wherever, all these, all these uh, the fantastic research labs and so much done there in the world of physics. And here's the standard realm of physical understanding of the universe, cosmology, I think over here you could find some very educated, even Nobel Prize winners who would say it's all wrong. It's all based upon the wrong assumptions. We need to turn that whole thing upon its head. We don't know a thing. I, I, and, and you could do that. I think certainly you could do it in theology. That would be my area of expertise. Uh, so if you can do it in physics, you can do it in health sciences, you can do it in theology, what areas could you not do it in? What areas could you say, yeah, that one, we absolutely know that one. I suspect you would find someone who is very knowledgeable in that field that would say, no, actually, we don't know it. It's, it's out there. I've been studying lately on gravity, that gravity, uh, uh, I don't know, what would you say, doesn't even exist uh, as, a, uh, as a force. Would I say that? Did I say that right? Uh, my, 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 my son is my uh, gravity teacher. Uh, uh, it's a different force, different kind of force than we have understood it to be. Uh, so, you know, all of this kind of stuff, it comes down to maybe we have to say, the Bible doesn't spell that one out completely. Wish I knew. I don't so much. Um, thanks, Rudy in Belgium. Let's go to Rancho Cucamonga, California. Michael has a question. He says, you say prophecy is not being fulfilled in this day and age. Oh, I just heard the collective gasp. <laughs> Someone out there saying, does that bald-headed New Mexico preacher believe that prophecy is not being fulfilled in our day and age? How can he say such a thing? Just look around us at all the prophecies being fulfilled. I teach a lot of prophecy and have for 30 years, and I think prophecy is not being fulfilled in this day and age. That, that is my position. I think that prophecy, the prophecy of the scripture, is, is set to be fulfilled, and sometimes even is setting to be fulfilled, but it is set to be fulfilled after the rapture. The rapture is the only prophecy for our dispensation. Now, there's my position. Obviously, it would take a little longer to convince you than just that. But let's just take that as my position here for a moment. So I believe in an age of the silence of God, as Sir Robert Anderson wrote about. You, you say prophecy is not being fulfilled in this day and age. Then please explain Ezekiel 37 and the return of the Jews. Okay, you know, in Ezekiel 37, Ezekiel 37 and 38 is the, uh, the Valley of Dry Bones coming. I, for many years, taught it as, hey, here's prophecy fulfilled right in our midst, uh, the nation of uh, Israel uh, returning. However, you know, when you, uh, w when you look at this uh, again closely in a, uh, shall we say, a persnickety manner, when you do it and you, you, you come in and uh, see what uh, takes place, well, first of all, Ezekiel 36, 37, I should say, the Valley of Dry Bones, and, and uh, at the end of chapter uh, 37, there is uh, uh, the establishment of the new covenant. Now, this, this throws a wrench in uh, evangelical theology because evangelical theology says we're already in the new covenant. But we got in the new covenant, according to evangelical theology, we got in the new covenant a long time before any of the Jews came back to their homeland. That's just been the last hundred years or so. And yet Ezekiel 37 has the return and then the new covenant. Now, I don't believe we're in the new covenant, by the way. 
I believe that the new covenant is uh, going to be established in the millennial time. It's been promised, it's been sealed in blood, but it has not been yet delivered and it will be delivered out there in that day. I think if, uh, let, me, let me add one more thing. Uh, Ezekiel 37, followed by Ezekiel 38 and 39, the, the battle uh, of, of Gog and Magog, and in Ezekiel 39, it ends with uh, the Lord reigning on this earth. I think you can take Ezekiel 36, 37, 38, 39, all in a future prophetic manner. You don't have to take any of it in a preterist manner, as in some of this has already been fulfilled in our lifetime. I think that, to my, my worldview is that our Lord offered, after his resurrection, he offered the kingdom to Israel. Israel rejected it. And uh, uh, Stephen asked for a little more time for the nation. And God says, okay, I'll give you a little more time. I'll let you all uh, deal with this for, uh, for uh, you know, 20, 30, 40 more years. Uh, but I also see this guy, Saul, down here. He's holding the coat. Ah, looks like a good young man right there. I'm going to choose him, and I am going to reveal something that is completely different than anything that goes along with prophecy. It's totally separate from prophecy. And uh, you, let me have this guy, Saul, right here, and I'm going to begin to work with him. A few years from now, I'm going to give him a revelation that will change everything. And I believe that you and I live under that Pauline revelation, the mystery as he calls it and as we call it. And uh, there was a little period of overlap in those two, the prophetic program and the mystery program. But with at least by 70 AD, the prophetic program was done. And the, the, the prophecy that was going to be fulfilled has been fulfilled. And God just put a pause and we live in a parenthetical age, which is not an age of the fulfillment of prophecy. God says, I am going to fulfill every prophecy, but right now I'm not dealing with nations. I'm, I'm not dealing with the Jewish nation right now. Right now, whosoever will may come. Right now, every man, woman, boy, or girl may come. And uh, right now, the offer is made to anyone, and it's, uh, you're, you're, you're not outside of the covenants in the commonwealth of Israel. It doesn't matter anymore. You're not without hope that uh, I am offering a, a gift of eternal life uh, to anyone by grace through faith, not of works so completely different from everything in the old covenant that you really can't even mix the two and you shouldn't mix the two. And if you do, you're going to be confused. And, uh, and so this is the age in which we live in. So the prophecy has been put on hold. Now, uh, things that are similar are not the same. And has there been a return to the Jewish people to their homeland? Yes. But if you look closely you'll see that it's not really the return that is described in the scriptures. It is a, a secular return. It is a secular nation. It does not have at all the, all of the, that really doesn't even have uh, all of the, it doesn't even have the Temple Mount at this point. Uh, that's uh, controlled by the Jordanians right now. All of, uh, you know, what's uh, called the Palestinian Authority uh, today as, uh, uh, you know, it's been contested since uh, 1948, basically, and has never really been under the control of, uh, of uh, the, the modern state of Israel. And if they marched in today to take control of that and of Gaza, it would be a war in the Middle East in lickety split. I mean, quicker than you could get China and Russia on it, uh, there would be war in the Middle East if they said, oh, no, we're going to take Gaza and we're going to take uh, the Palestinian Authority, sometimes called the West Bank, behind the Green Line, as Obama used to say. Uh, we're going to take that. We're going to take that. So, so uh, it's a pretty sad fulfillment of Ezekiel 36. Uh, I think that in the end, we would have to say it, we'd be better off saying Ezekiel 36, 37, 38, 39 are all reserved in the future because there's too many footnotes that we have to have, explanations why it doesn't look exactly like that, that we have to have when we try 
to apply it today? Appreciate uh, that question from Rancho Cucamonga, California. God bless uh, you. And uh, let's, uh, let's see, let's go uh, to, um, let's go to uh, San Antonio, Texas. Uh, did God breathe the Holy Spirit in Adam? Genesis chapter two, verse seven. Also, did Adam die spiritually? Genesis two, 17. Genesis two, seven. The Lord God formed man out, out of the dust of the ground and breathed his nostrils, uh, the breath of life, and man became a living soul. You know, um, the, uh, let, let me just give a, a, a little comment on here. I just pulled up the ESV on the left hand of the side of the screen. Man became a living creature. Living soul is a much, much, much better translation. All of the newer translations make man a creature. Well, I happen to think we're made in the image of God and, uh, and the fact that, you know, even prior to this, you got, uh, you know, aardvarks and, uh, and platypuses and everything else that are living creatures. You got crabs and lobsters down there. They're living creatures. But now for the first time, there is a living soul. He, he made him a living soul. Now, did God breathe the Holy Spirit into Adam? I don't think so. I think God gave the breath of life into Adam, including the spiritual life that was his. But is this the indwelling of the Holy Spirit? I think theologically we would probably separate those out. Now, you could argue that Paul in the, excuse me, that uh, Adam in the Garden of Eden had the Holy Spirit indwelling. That, that would appear to be uh, uh, something that would be uh, not exactly what the text says. Now, the uh, related uh, question, uh, did uh, Adam die spiritually of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil? Thou shalt not eat of it. For the day thou eatest thereof, thou shalt surely die. That, uh, it's difficult to get into Hebrew and English there. Uh, I wouldn't say he died spiritually. He was a very alive spirit. What happened on that particular day? The Hebrew actually says, in the day that you eat of it, dying, you shall die. He didn't die spiritually. He didn't die physically. But he started on that highway, started on that process, separated from God before, before chapter 3 is out. Uh, but is that spiritual death? I don't think so, because he's still a living soul. I'm Dr. Randy White. This is Ask the Theologian. You can find us at askthetheologian.com. And we are back, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, thanks, Manny, for uh, the good question there, I appreciate uh, that. Let's see what uh, what what other questions have uh, we got uh, here. How about uh, Robert in Holly Springs, Mississippi? I keep hearing right dividing people talk about all of Paul's letters being addressed to the scattered, uncircumcised Hebrews. My studies have not led to this idea. Can you weigh in on this? Now, uh, um, there was a little follow-up comment from Deb. This was a number of days ago. Uh, I know exactly what you mean. They are, uh, they're now following someone that doesn't agree with, uh, let's see. Uh, oh, never mind. That was, that was a different comment. Okay. <laughs> there we go, Robert. Um, Paul's letter is being addressed to uncircumcised Hebrews. I, let, me, let me say I have not, I, I've not heard this. Now, I have the disadvantage in that I, uh, I only occasionally listen to another right dividing preacher. Uh, this is not because I don't like them and because I think there's some good ones out there. It's just that uh, I 
have nine broadcasts every week and um, and a Romans retreat coming up and always something uh, coming up and I'm always just doing my own study. Uh, so every now and then I will go back and listen to one, especially if I know there's one out there that's on a particular topic that I want to hear. Uh, but because I don't, I, I don't get around much and listen to some of these, I don't always know the uh, the lingo that's out there uh, and the way they're using the lingo. There is in the right dividing community, and I am sort of an outsider, Johnny, come lately to the community. Uh, so in the right dividing community, they kind of have their own dictionary. They kind of have their own ways. This is not a slam. This is just, uh, this is what happens. Uh, you know, it's the same way, uh, you know, I can go in a Baptist church and feel comfortable. Uh, I go in some other churches and I'm like, I don't really know. What, am I supposed to do this? Am I supposed to do that? Am I, how am I supposed to dress? What am I supposed to? Uh, you know, you just, it's, a, it's a cultural kind of thing. In the right dividing culture, they'll talk about some of these things and I don't really know what they're talking about. Now, sometimes when I hear them, I agree. Sometimes when I, when I figure out what it is, I don't agree. On the surface, let me say, I don't, I don't get this. Now, it, it could be Robert's fault, <laughs> could it be? Uh, you know, it could be Robert's fault that, uh, okay, the way he said it um, uh, maybe mischaracterizes the right dividing community. Or it could be that Robert, you know, pinned the tail on the donkey exactly in the right spot. Uh, so Paul's letters being addressed to the scattered, uncircumcised Hebrews. I, I don't think so. I think that there is some writing of Paul to Hebrews, I would say not uncircumcised. I I don't see any evidence of uncircumcised, but I think Paul does have uh, some, some word to scattered Hebrews, like the Corinthians, diaspora Hebrews, if you will, uh, and so you do have to look within Paul's writings and say, okay, is this a message to the Hebrew people, whether they're scattered or they're local? And I think Paul, because he went out about, he knew people out here and there, I think it's more natural for him to write in Jews, to write to Jews in Corinth or Thessalonica, places like this, more so than it is for him to write to Jews in Jerusalem though I think he wrote the book of Hebrews, which would be probably to Jews in Jerusalem. But basically, the message is the same. Wherever these Jews are, this kingdom message is the same. Uh, so would, would I see him writing to uncircumcised Hebrews and that sort of his message? Uh, I would have to tweak that quite a bit before I could take that idea. Now, once again, uh, it, it may be that... Uh, I, I don't uh, understand that quite right and um, could uh, come across that later in a uh, different way. And uh, so I appreciate, uh, appreciate the question. Uh, speaking of scattered Hebrews, Alex in London is the Ephesian church and the church at Ephesus in Revelation chapter 2 the same? I think so. Uh, sort of. Sort of, I think so. How's that? <laughs> uh, same town. And if there is any uh, connection to... In, in, in Revelation chapter 2, if that could be applied in the current day of John's writings, then yeah, basically they're the same church. They're going to be, uh, you know, 40 years apart, 30 years apart. Uh, I think the same location. I really do think, I, you know, I started to say yes, and now I'm going to say no. I really do think that Revelation chapter 2 is speaking of an Ephesian church in the future. I would put it in Ephesus, but in the future, after the rapture. I think Revelation 2 and 3 refer to churches after the rapture. And so so in that sense, it would be hard to call a church, let's say the rapture is today, I'd be all for it. And with the rapture being today, then... uh, 
um, you know, the the church at Ephesus gets their letter, you know, two or three years from now. That's not the same church as one, you know, in our book of Ephesians. So in that sense, they're separated by the distance of miles. But same church? Yeah, I think so. And if you want to apply uh, Revelation chapter 2 to that current day and say Revelation 2 is preterist or already fulfilled, then it would definitely be the same church. But that's not my position. My position is that Revelation 2 and 3, the seven churches, the the seven messengers, really, uh, the letters to the seven messengers are uh, all future, not preterist, and not dynamic that is applied through all time. Uh, So that, because I take one as future and one as past, the book of Ephesians, Paul's epistle to the Ephesians uh, is past, and the letter to the messenger at the church at Ephesus is future. I guess the best way would be to say, no, that's not the same. uh, They're different. Thanks, Alex. Uh, Appreciate uh, that question. And, And we're out of time. And uh, I get so, I, 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 it, it just bothers me to have to leave questions done. Although, let's take one more. Because I got one from Jose Miguel Mercedes in Iguay, Alta Gracia, La, La, Alta Gracia. I think that's it. The higher grace, Alta Gracia. Jose, the pastor down there, Miguel, uh, has a question. I want to put that up because he's our missionary of the month starting midnight, July. Uh, Pastor down there, right dividing pastor in a non-right dividing uh, community. Uh, You should do something with that Alta Gracia stuff. Am I I wrong that that means uh, like higher grace or the high grace, Mm, capitalize on that. If that's what that means, capitalize on it. Say, people, we are people of Alta Gracia. We can't, we can't stick with this low grace stuff. We're high grace people, Pauline grace, that is us. There we go. And revolutionaries. I read a little history on Igwe. Alta Gracia. Revolutionaries. Being people of higher grace, we are going to revolutionize the evangelical thinking of the Dominican Republic. Okay, all of that was free. That's not about the question. <laughs> Here's the question. Can you please share your thoughts about Christians playing the lottery? I've seen a couple of uh, known Christians winning millions of pesos through the lottery in my country. Thanks very much for your hard work and thanks for yours as well. Uh, Christians playing the lottery. You know, being a man of alta gracia, higher grace, I, I want to be careful not to move from one form of legalism to another form of legalism. And as a fundamentalist, uh, I, I kind of like legalism. I kind of like rules, you know, bring it on. Uh, thou shalt not play the lottery. And yet I do have to remind ourselves, m- remind myself, how's that? <laughs> I have to remind myself that uh, we live in an age in which God has not given us a set of commandments. Therefore, I'll I'll take the words of Paul and and paraphrase them just a little bit, but whatever your hand finds to do, do it with all your might. Whether you eat, whether you drink, do it under the glory of God. That really is our rule for living. It's a rule of grace. So would I preach a sermon or put out an edict that uh, no Christian should play the lottery. Uh, I might argue for it, but I wouldn't put any kind of a legalistic kind of thing there. Now, uh, I think from a, from a spiritual logic, from a, from a biblically informed view, 
I think I could look and say, you know, why? Uh, uh, first of all, I, we were talking about this just the other day, incidentally, as uh, our uh, uh, interns here and Nathan and uh, whatnot, we were sitting around having lunch and, uh, and talking about playing the lottery, which none of us play. And I said, you know, the, 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 the thing I notice is down at the convenience store that I go to, just about every time somebody in front of me is, you know, buying the lottery tickets, picking out their lottery tickets and all that kind of stuff. And my, my comment was, they never look rich. These people never look rich doing it. Well, okay. Why do I want to mimic that? It doesn't look like it's working for very many people. Logically, I think about the lottery, we ought to be saying the lottery hurts a lot more people than it helps. I mean, it helps... Uh, one guy who's the winner, theoretically, the government tells us that it helps, you know, education or parks and wildlife or what, you know, whatever it is that they say they're giving that money to. Uh, and, um, you know, I, I, my lying eyes might be deceiving me, but, uh, I would question the assumptions about whether it actually does, but it, it hurts a lot more people because it, is a, 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 um, uh, a, a, you know, going on a wing and a prayer, hoping I can finally hit it big, going on a wing and a prayer. Uh, and, you know, there's a, there's a little meme going on around here that's pretty decent. It says uh, it's, uh, it's about uh, the best, this, this has to change now with inflation, but it says best way to turn uh, uh, 40 bucks into 1,000 bucks is to put $40 worth of gasoline in your car and drive to work. <laughs> and, uh, you know, that 40 miraculously uh, on payday turns into 1000 Okay. I think we can teach that there's better things to do with the money. Uh, you know, honestly, if a person just kind of has a hope to get rich, I would say they ought to know about the magic of compound interest. Uh, especially a young person, you know, if, if you, if you put a dollar a week into, uh, into a, you know, a savings account, you know, you can go on now, you can buy a fraction of a share of stock, pick a decent stock. that has got some good fundamentals and put a dollar a week into it and, and never touch it till you retire. You'll end up rich. Or, you know, you can even do it just, you know, putting it into, uh, I don't know, you can't hardly do a savings account now, but just stick it away. Uh, do something with some compounding interest. And man, you, for a dollar a week, you can, you can end up with some big time money 20 or 30 years. Um, so I think rather than being legalistic and saying, thou shalt not play the lottery, I think we can, we can say, hey, uh, I understand you have a real desire and a hope and a prayer that someday you won't be struggling under the burden that you're struggling under now. Uh, what's the best way to get there? I think the scripture says, uh, I'll, I'll, I'll again paraphrase Paul in 2 Thessalonians, uh, Work with your hands and uh, feed your family. Take care of your own business. Do it well. Do that for a long time. You probably will end up better than you started. Uh, and because there is a, uh, a, a desire for something better. And I don't want to shame that desire. I think that desire, I like that ambition. In fact, this is a side point, but I don't know how it is in the Dominican Republic, but uh, here in the United States, more and more states, including my own this year, uh, have uh, passed um, uh, legalized marijuana use. Uh, the, the, the biggest problem I have with marijuana use is that it takes away motivation, drive. I uh, heard it the other day. I was a kid that should have some potential, but he's so laid back. Another kid comes in. They obviously knew each other. I was kind of watching in on this thing. And, hey, man, what you doing? Oh, just chilling. 
just chilling. And every time I see this kid, yeah. just chilling. Yeah. Yeah. I'll say, quit chilling. Somebody needs a light of fire under your bottom, boy. Get up and do something. You could, you could make something of your life. But so, so the, the lottery maybe even is a, uh, shall we say, um, uh, what do they call that? Uh, the, the, the entry, the, the entry gate or whatever to, uh, you know, just chilling. I'm not really going to work for my millions. I'm just going to throw out a buck every now and then and hope it comes, you know, cast your bread upon the waters. And after many days, it will come to you. <laughs> uh, so I just, I think it's a, it's a, it's a poor way to go about all of this. I, uh, I see a couple of comments uh, here. Uh, let's see. Uh, uh, the lottery's attacks on the foolish. <laughs> yeah. Uh, that Bob says attacks on the foolish. Uh, Scott says attacks on the poor. And, and it is. It, it's, it's, uh, I've heard it uh, said, you know, the lottery is a tax on people who don't know math uh, <laughs> because the odds are just so bad. Uh, honestly, you could you could probably find a way to invest your dollar, buy something that you could sell for a dollar five and then invest your dollar five and find something you could sell for a dollar 10 and, and just work your way up and come out much, much, much better. Uh, and, and that kind of motivation, I think is what we want to instill within ourselves and our families and, uh, and uh, carry that out in that way. I appreciate uh, that. Uh, it'd be interesting to know how culturally all that works uh, in uh, the uh, the activities in uh, Alta Gracia, the higher grace. Thanks, Miguel. I appreciate that. We're praying for you this month. Okay, it is time for me to go. And I do want to remind you that uh, tonight we have the Epistle of James, rightly divided, verse by verse. And we'll be doing that at 7 p.m. I'll be studying this afternoon, getting ready for that. Look forward to that. Once again, uh, no broadcast tomorrow because I'll be studying the book of Romans. No broadcast Monday because I will be uh, singing, it's a grand old flag, it's a high flying flag, la da 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 Maybe by Monday, I'll know the words. Uh, and uh, celebrating our independence uh, here and praying for the country that we ought to be, which is not the country that most of us think we are. Uh, but anyway, I will be here on Sunday and we're going to talk about idolatry and the book of Philippians 9.45 and then 10.45 uh, to uh, take care of both of those. Uh, until then, thanks for being with us uh, here. I will see you s- tonight. Tonight, the book of James. I'll see you all soon. God bless.